Hey, in BMX racing, man, when it comes to your gate starts, there are so many different ways that we could start making your gate starts better, more powerful, integrating discipline. And in this video, I want to give you my best secrets when it comes to training professionals, training Olympic athletes, and give you the best secrets that you could start integrating if you guys want to take your racing to the next level. Let's talk about it. All right, guys. Hey, welcome back to another Tuesday night edition of BMX Coach Live. I am your host, three-time Olympic coach, Greg Romero, coming from you live in San Diego. Hope you guys are having an awesome Tuesday. If you guys are in Australia, hope you guys are having an awesome Wednesday. Man, it feels so good to be here. I'm so glad that, man, We here in America, we had an awesome July 4th weekend. There was some racing in South Park, uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, man, man, Lots of racing coming up. The worlds are coming up. Lots of races to be had here in America. Hope across the world you guys are starting to race. I know in England they're starting to race. Australia, they're kind of like still on a lockdown. They're kind of going through the winter time. So this is a great time for you guys to start, you know, working on your gate starts, working on your goals, working on your uh, your discipline and, and integrating all these awesome ideas that I have for you. Uh, in an effort to help you improve your gate start. That way you guys can start coming out of the gate with more power, getting more hole shots, winning more races, and start dominating the first straight. Hey, we're we're doing a live show here today. So if you guys are watching on the replay, make sure that you guys subscribe to the channel. Make sure you guys hit the bell notification. And that way you guys get notified when I post or when I go live. Um, man, awesome crew showing up in the live stream. Jacob James says, he got his sprints in. Matt McCluey says, what's up, coach? Uh, JP says, hey, coach. Uh, Tyson Allen says, how's it going, coach G? Uh, Brady F19, what's up? Ricky Clark, hello, coach. Uh, and yeah, man, a game, game line 2709, hello, he says. And Jacob James says, perfect topic after yesterday's track session. Jacob, I'm wondering, how was your track session yesterday, man? Hey, listen, if you guys are just tuning in, um, Man, again, we're talking about gate starts, and uh, I say we just get right straight into it, okay? Um, Want to talk about my three, my top three pro tips on gate starts, right? Now, you know, a lot of the people on this channel, on this channel, we get a lot of different people, right? We get beginners, we get intermediates, we get the, uh, the struggling experts, and then we get a lot of guys that are, uh, that have been racing a long time, or who are professionals or, or semi-professional and, you know, they're looking for an edge. They're looking for uh, different ways and different perspectives or different ideas that will help them improve their gate starts, get more out of their gate starts. Because at the end of the day, the gate start, as simple as it is, sometimes it can be complicated, right? Is it not like at the end of the day, it's, it's such an easy thing to do, um, but there's so, much, so many things physically technique, emotional, uh, mental. Um, there's so many different things going on in terms of how to get a gate start, right? And then you have the different discrepancies in terms of like a beginner's gate start, right? An intermediate, uh, an expert, a pro. And depending on how, how tall you are, how, how much do you weigh, you know, what, what's your strength like, right? Are you 12 and under? Are you 12 and over? Because at the end of the day, there's so many different things that can influence a gate start, uh, no matter what you guys um, are in terms of age and uh, proficiency. And so, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, number one, right? Number one, uh, the gate start technique is, is really critical, right? And again, presupposing that you guys or know how to ride a bike, you guys are already racing, and you guys are, are in it to win it, right? You guys are the serious BMX racer. I, I kind of want to focus on you guys a little bit more. Um, today, I, I, I tend to focus a little bit on the beginner and intermediate side, but I do, I do need to spread the wealth here, and I want to help out the guys 
uh, that are in it to win it. They straight up are, you know, they're experts or maybe perhaps you're an intermediate and you want to move into expert. And, you know, if you're, if you're a beginner, then maybe this will inspire you to keep moving up and progressing. But at the end of the day, I want to help out the guy that is really in it to win it. The guy that is serious about BMX racing, someone that is going deep into the craft and wanting to master the gate starts. I want to help you guys out. And first and foremost, number one, I know it, it comes back down to the gate start technique. And, and that is so fundamental, right? Like sometimes it's like, oh, we're talking about technique. That's, that's for beginners. And, and no, at the end of the day, it's not because I would say that, listen, I always talk about the story of one of my athletes back in 2016, a, a kid named Corbin Shira, in which his strength was good. His technique was pretty good to the naked eye, right? To, to, to any untrained eye or, um, or anyone watching, gate start technique is awesome, right? Awesome second pedal, awesome third pedal. And at the end of the day, you know, it came down to me really scrutinizing the technique, even for a high caliber rider, uh, you know, who a guy that's winning pro world championships, who's an Olympian, who's winning World Cups, who's winning um, uh, AA pro nationals. Even these top level guys, it all comes back down to the technique. And so, you know, if you're looking to improve, advance, get more power out of your gate start, looking to uh, improve your acceleration or improve your uh, reaction, it, at the end of the day, it still comes back down to the fundamentals of your technique. And so when it comes to your technique, are you getting into the second pedal acceleration position? Because at the end of the day, that's, that's like the goal, right? Sure, the goal is to react. The goal is to get a, a nice first pedal, but really at the end of the day, it's all about getting a good second, third pedal acceleration position, right? And then dialing it back, re re reverse engineer from there, and then focus on your first movement technique, right? And your reaction. But more importantly, you know, reaction technique is, hey, are you moving with your head and shoulders first? Is your gate start stance configured? Could you lower your pedal a little bit? Is your heel too low or too high? You have all these different things that are affecting your reaction, therefore your first pedal acceleration, therefore your second pedal acceleration, right? Everything happens in a sequential dependency, if you will, right? If the goal is to get into the second and third pedal, then what's your first pedal, ex ex what's your first pedal explosion like? And if your first pedal explosion isn't complementary to your second and third pedal acceleration position, then what is your gate start stance looking like? So, you know, at, at that high level, we're already thinking about second, third pedal. Some of you guys who are beginner and intermediate, you guys are still trying to focus on the on balancing, right? And at the end of the day, that's that's the goal. You're not really there in terms of thinking second, third pedal acceleration. Now, I'm not saying not everyone's there, but majority of, you know, when I was a beginner, I wasn't there, right? I, I was just trying to focus on balancing and trying to work out my nerves and, and trying to, you know, just trying to get the focus because, you know, my eyes are going all over the place. I'm watching the race in front of me, paying attention to the guy behind me. I'm watching, you know, uh, the announcer and, and, and also the gate starter, there's so many different things going on. You know, you have to be able to work on certain things in an effort to take on all this extra external stimuli, right? In an effort to get into a deeper focus, into a deeper practice of working on your gate start technique. You're just trying to balance, right? You're trying to balance and also work on all this different external stimuli that's coming at you. The pros, they're already kind of dialed in and the majority of the experts are dialed in in terms of, you know, if you guys are regulars always going to the track, you guys are used to the external stimuli, except what maybe occasionally when you go to that national and, you know, the, it's a different environment and there's different competition and, you know, the announcer sounds different, the track smells different. And, you know, you, then you have all these things that are hitting your submodalities and it's, it's kind of tricking you that, hey, things are different, but at the end of the day, your gate start technique shouldn't be different, okay? One technique, one technique, work on, again, the goal for you guys is to get into that second, third pedal acceleration position. That way you guys de deliver optimal power, optimal, um, 
Yeah, optimal power. Really, at the end of the day, that's 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 the goal. And then in an effort to get there, you got to make sure that your gate start stance, your reaction is good, and yeah. Now that being said, what what what's my what's my number two pro tip? Okay, again, working on guys that are you know Olympic caliber. I, we can't help but not address strength and power, right? Hello, we are BMX training. You know, a, a lot of my coaching was really, really focused on training base, really just getting under the bar and lifting a bun bunch of weight and getting strong. And, and, and for, the, for the majority of us, that's not always the practice. But if you guys are looking, if, if you guys are serious and you guys are over 13 and you guys are in it to win it, you guys are looking to become top amateurs, top pros, or Olympic caliber riders, then you guys gotta be working on your strength and power. Especially if you guys are looking to improve and advance your power development out of the gate. Sure, technique is gonna work all day long, right? It's gonna help all day long. You gotta complement that with strength and power. Super critical. Now, what's so important about strength and power? Well, there's only so much specificity that you could do on the bike, right? There's only so many different sprints. Let's just say you do one type of sprint and one type of gait, right? And that's, and that's all you do. Granted, you can get a, you can get away with it. You can get away in go. terms of developing a lot of strength and power and, and technique just out of doing those two exercises. However, if you want to go to that next level, right? Again, a guy that's in it to win it, a guy that's serious about maybe getting a, a new factory ride, winning some nationals, you know, not only going to regionals, but in winning and dominating regionals, and then going to nationals and making mains consistently and, and wanting to win mains consistently and, and get on the podium consistently. And guys that may aspire to go, you know, they, they might want to turn pro or, or even potentially even go to the Olympics, right? I mean, I hear all these big dreams all the time, but you know, where's, where's the strength and power development? Are you guys integrating a serious strength and power program? Now, you know, why not endurance? Why not running? Why not doing other things? Well, I think they, listen, if you guys want an awesome gate start, power is key, right? You're, you know, if your technique is dialed, okay, even if your technique is not dialed, sometimes you're gonna need strength and, strength and power development. Uh, in an effort to, to work on the technique, right? Such as core work, such as working on the triple extension between the hip, knee, and ankle joints so you can go. deliver power into that first stroke and have the core strength to hold yourself in that ideal second, third pedal position and deliver power into that second half stroke. Listen, if power is king when it comes to overcoming inertia of a gate start, right? Overcoming an inertia of a gate start is basically overcoming... Uh, dead weight, if you will. Really, it, there, there's a force to dead weight, but really at the end of the day, your challenge is to overcome both your bike, which isn't doing anything, and your body that's just sitting there. And you gotta move all that, right? I'm 180 pounds plus a, you know, we'll just say a 20 pound bike, that's that's 200 pounds of, of inertia that I need to overcome. Right? And if, I won't, if I'm only strong enough to move 200 pounds, Let's say, you know, there's another replica of me right next to me and they're capable of overcoming that by 200 pounds of, I'm sorry, by, by say 300 pounds, right? One and a half times stronger, then they're gonna conceivably come out faster than me. More explosion and exponentially, they're just gonna, they're just gonna keep walking away down the there first jump. So, BMX gate starts are power dependent and the limiting factor to power is strength. Really, it's force, right? Because at the end of the day, power is force, force, force times mass acceleration, right? Right? Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> force is how fast you can move it over time, okay? At the end of the day. And so, um, I'm sorry, power is how fast you can move force over time. <laughs> <laughs> and so at the end of the day, the limiting factor is strength, right? How much weight you, you can lift. And, you know, a guy, guys that are Olympic caliber athletes in all disciplines, I'm, I'm talking like, you know, track and field, not only BMX, uh, swimming, track and field, basketball players, NFL players, 
some of the top athletes that are sprint athletes, dude, they're like for let's use in a squat for example. Let's use a, let's we use a, let's use a squat for example. They're squatting anywhere from two to two and a half times the body weight. Some of the best BMXers in the world that are fighting for gold medals are lifting two go. and a half times the body weight. And that's incredible, right? That is absolutely incredible. So, um, man, two and a half times your body weight. If, if, I'm a, if I'm 200 pounds, two and a half times my body weight, dude, that's like 450 pounds, is it not? I mean, that's a lot of weight. I got work to do, okay? If I'm not at two and a half, at least get to two, right? At least get to 400 pounds, if you will. And, and that, that will allow me to be competitive at the highest level. Now, you know, is, is that necessary for an expert? Probably not, probably not. But, you know, at least get to one to, to two times your body weight, right? One to two times your body weight, you could do a lot with that. That's, that's exceptional, right? A lot of people have a hard time lifting their own body weight. You can get there and you're a top expert. Maybe you're an older top expert cruiser rider. You don't lift. Man, if you can get into the gym and start lifting your own body weight, and, and, and then from there you can progress to one and a half times your body weight, dude, you're going to be killing the gate stars, right? Your, your first pedal is going to be a lot more explosive. Your second pedal is going to be a lot more explosive. You're going to have more acceleration. You're going to be deadlier. And people are going to be scared of you. And really, at the end of the day, that's, that's half the battle when it comes to BMX. Is, is just being a strong rider. Uh, being strong intimidates the competition. So guys, you guys got to get into, into a strength and tra strength training regimen, right? Consistently. Strength and power is key, right? Not only in the gym, you know, for, for kids that are 12 and under, you guys could do a lot of body weight exercises. And that, again, you know, at the end of the day, the younger riders are also overcoming inertia of their own body weight. So if we can get them to start doing strength and conditioning using own body weight, man, that's great. That's a great start. Furthermore, you guys can also do sprints, right? Okay. Um, you know, not only doing gate starts will help, help improve the gate starts, but doing sprints is going to help your acceleration. And, you know, it's crazy how many people um, don't see the value of sprints. Now, I, I was speaking, again, about 12 and under that we're doing body weight exercises. You guys can also do sprints to work on the strength. Right? You, guys, you guys just do sprints on flat ground. Okay, you're working on force, right? Because typically a gait is going to have go. a little bit of an angle. And when you start to do sprints and, and level it out, it's going to require more force. So technically you are doing force strength work just by doing simply a flat ground sprint. Cool. All right, so I got a video queued up for this a little fun video. Let's see here. Number three, having the pro discipline. Now, I picked this video of Anthony Dean. I was looking for videos and looking for pictures, and I was looking around. I was like, oh, yeah, Anthony Dean, one of my favorite Australians, man, and he's heading to the Olympics. And talk about a guy who is super disciplined, who likes to not only have fun, but he's disciplined in doing the hard work, right? Good-looking dude. You know, dude ha owns a business, loves BMX, works on his gate starts, works on his sprints, and goes to the gym on the regular, right? Talk about a rider that you guys could easily model that has a lot of fun, but at the same time has big goals and his work ethic matches the goals. Oh, that's something that maybe you guys should consider. If you guys don't have a goal, where's the discipline going to come from? Maybe you should consider having a goal. And then you need to, and then you need to maybe perhaps model someone that has big goals that you admire. And, you know, obviously you want to model someone that has a good work ethic. Okay. Because don't get me wrong. There's always that anomaly. There's always that one rider who is exceptionally talented, exceptionally strong, and they just don't have the discipline. Right. And then they end up fizzling out, you know, once they go from amateur to, to pro and then they kind of fizzle out in pro because it's like, oh, you know, the, the, the way, the way they, the, their lack of, of regimen, you know, starts to catch up with them because you're, you're working against guys that have big goals and they're matching those big goals with big discipline, big work ethic, putting in the work. Okay. And, I, and I, it's crazy. It, it's, it's crazy. 
you know, at the end of the day, you know, discipline is all about putting the work in week in, week out, right? Setting up a schedule for yourself. You know, I'll quote one of my favorite books. Uh, a guy, a guy, an author by the name of James Clear wrote a book called Atomic Habits. And it's really simple. He says, look, if you're looking to create change, if you're looking to integrate and change or either change a habit and, and, and integrate something new into your life, then you simply just need to write it down the night before and be specific of what you're doing why, why you're doing it and where are you going to do it or who you're going to do it with, right? Like be real, have a lot of intent in terms of what you're going to do. Because if you have no intent and you just say, I'm going to do it, well, that doesn't really mean anything, right? Anyone can say, hey, you know, I, I could start lifting tomorrow and, and I'm going to be the number one pro or I'm going to be the number one whatever, veteran pro or if I'm a 15 year old, I'm gonna start I'm gonna start training this week and and work on being, you know, the world champion. Okay, great. What are you doing week in, week out? What are you doing tomorrow? Are you writing it down? Are you being specific of what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, who are you going to do it with, and for what purpose are you doing it? Okay. Because the more reasons you have, the more the easier it's going to be for you guys to do it, okay? And that's really truly what discipline's all about, because there's only so much. There's only so much willpower when we wake up in the morning. It's like, oh yeah, you know, yesterday I talked about doing sprints and doing, and being the number one 15 expert amateur, and you know what? Maybe you know, maybe you know, after breakfast I should probably do something about it. Gee, what am I going to do? Do you've lost half the battle? And it's like, man, you know, what am I going to do? Should I, should I go to the track? Should I go to the gym? Should I, should I do sprints? I don't know. Uh, at that point, you're just going to choose whatever's easier for you to do. Whatever, uh, not only easier, but in terms of like, what's the easiest thing that you can access? And then what's going to be easier physically, emotionally, mentally, right? Because that's how the human bodies, human bodies, man. I mean, for the most part, we don't really care for change. Right. If we're going to integrate change, we're going to come up with new goals, then we have to integrate new change. And it's really, really tough on a lot of us. So that's where discipline comes from. Discipline comes from, again, having goals, having a purpose, and then having a schedule. OK, what are you going to do for training? Where are you going to do it? Who are you going to do it with? All right. Cool. Awesome. See what's going on here in the live chat. Oh shoot, couldn't hear me over. Oh, they couldn't hear me. <laughs> oh God. Um, let, let's see here, can I fix that video? Can I fix that video? Was it too loud? Should we go back and talk about it? Man, please forgive me. Okay, so strength and power. <laughs> strength and power. Oh my gosh, I forgot what I said. But, you know, at the end of the day, strength and power is, you know, gate starts is, is dependent on power, right? Gate starts are dependent on power. And at the end of the day, you know, you're overcoming a lot of inertia of your own body and bike weight. Okay, that's what I was trying to say earlier. Please forgive me. And at the end of the day, it requires power. Now, what's the limiting factor to power? Limiting factor to power is strength. So what are we doing for strength development, right? Are we going to the gym? And, and, and earlier I was talking about like, you know, if you're over 13, you guys can start weightlifting, right? When I was 13, I started weightlifting, right? And, you know, we could get strong simply by doing gate starts. We could get strong by simply doing simply doing sprints. Okay. I, I agree. I, I think that's helpful. But if you guys were in it to win it, like majority of you guys are, are in the live show are looking to do. Oh, now you guys are saying it's all good. Just kidding. Am I just repeating myself or what? Come on guys. Anyways, I fixed it. So I'm just going to repeat myself real quick and make it short and sweet. But you know, at the end of the day, like, <laughs> it, 
if you guys are in it to win it and you guys are aspiring top experts, someone that wants to start winning races, someone that wants to start getting into the main, someone that wants to start getting on the podium, someone that wants to start winning regional races, state races, nationals, going for that world, world championship title, turning pro, man, you guys are going to have to become gym rats. <laughs> I mean, straight up. <laughs> you guys are going to have to become... You guys, you guys are gonna have to become gym rats, okay? All right, so the live feed, guys, like, can you hear it now? Is it good? Or you, was it okay before? Because I don't want guys that are watching this on the replay being like, dude, this dude's repeating himself. Come on, help me out, guys. Come on. The crew's, the crew's playing games with me. That's what happens when they get familiar with me. They start playing games. But yeah, man, you guys, listen, strength and power is key. You know, you know, we were talking about technique, we were talking about power, we were talking about discipline. And at the end of the day, um, you know, BMX training, when it comes to working on your gait start, right? It, there's so much repetition already. It's like, oh gosh, I have to go do repetition in the gym. Yes, you guys are sprinting athletes, right? Sprinting athletes spend a lot of time working on their acceleration, whether you're track and field, whether you're a pro football player, rugby, Tennis players are, are, are sprinting athletes, right? They're, they're acceleration uh, dependent, right? So at the end of the day, you got, okay, so they couldn't hear over the safety bar step up video. Okay, cool. But yeah, at the end of the day, you guys are sprinting athletes. And so therefore, you guys are also gym rats, okay? And I mean that in a good way. And, and you know, for a lot of us, it'd be, you know, for girls and guys, working out in the gym, it, you know, it, it, it helps us look better, right? We, we develop muscles. Um, it increases confidence. Um, it increases strength. And, and, and increasing strength in the, in the way we look, man, it, it just overall it helps with our, with our energy, our aura, our, our confidence, right? All these intangibles. This, besides the fact of, of obviously objectively getting stronger, right? If we can get stronger off the bike, right? Then we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to transfer that on the bike because you're at the end of the day, it's really tough for us to get any stronger than what we already impose either through gait starts or sprints, right? The only way you could get stronger is if you pro potentially switch up those sprints, right? Make the gear harder, go from clip pedals to flat pedals and practice, uh, sprints with flat pedals. Um, doing uphill sprints. You have to change the demand, right? And at the end of the day, there's only so many things we need to change that there's only so many things that we can change up. We're very limited on the bike. So in an effort to continuously improve ourselves and progress our acceleration power out of the gate, we have to do it alternative, alter, alternatively off the bike. That means getting into the gym. And in the gym is where we can create a lot of magic in terms of imposing different demands, right? As you can see here, I, you know, I had the, you know, the safety, uh, doing bilateral work, unilateral work, uh, working on strength work, working on speed work, working on dynamic effort work with like bands right here that Corbin's doing, okay? Um, there's all kinds of different ways that you guys can alternatively uh, play with the engine, if you will, right? You guys can improve force, improve improve um, velocity. I would say a lot easier than you could do, a lot more dynamic than you could do, and with a lot more options than you could do than just doing sprints and gate starts alone. Okay, that's where you guys can make a huge difference if you guys could get into the gym and develop your strength and power. All right. Okay. Cool. Well, hey, listen, you guys. Um, right after this, we're going to do, I'm curious to know, I'm really curious to know if you guys have any questions for me um, when it comes to any of these pro tips in terms of gate start technique, in terms of strength and power, in terms of discipline, okay? So you guys, come up with your best questions and we're going to address these right after the break.
Hey guys, I have a question. What would it do for you if you could enhance your power out of the gate, enhance your sprint speed down the first straight, enhance your skills, enhance your mental performance mind state? What would that do for your racing or your kids racing? If you're seeing the value of enhancing your BMX performance, consider joining the community of BMX Training Pro and get the same access my Olympic athletes have enjoyed, as well as thousands of BMXers all over the world. Some members use the access to improve their gate start techniques. Some also use the access to keep them motivated to train. And you'll find your reason when you gain access and join BMX Training Pro today. Stay focused, get ready now. For real, get ready now. Metro with the nice flow. Stay focused, get ready now. For real, get ready now. Let's go. Stay focused, in the heat come. Concentrate to the sound of the beat drum. Start it up, take it back now. Check, check it out. This is how it's going down. Yeah. All right, guys. Hey, welcome back. Checking out the questions over here. And uh, let's see, we got a comment from uh, Tyson Allen says, just started weightlifting as a 5'5", 13 year old. Is starting off with 10 pounds too much or too little? I don't know, I would say at the end of the day, man, congrats, just starting is enough. And here's the thing, continuing that momentum every day, every week, every month, and you know, having goals and integrating those goals into your work ethic, right? At the end of the day, I keep saying at the end of the day, huh? Someone gave me, someone gave me shit for that. But, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> man, you guys are killing me tonight. You guys are making me laugh. It's all about, listen, Tyson, it's, it's all about um, integrating your goals with the work ethic and the work ethic with the goals, right? Marinating those two together and that's what's gonna help you progress, right? And, and that's what you want. At, at 13 year old, that's perfect, man. Like just taking action and again, we, we talked about, like as a 13 year old, a goal for you should be to do a squat with great technique and hire somebody, hire, uh, hire a sports specific trainer that can help you and you know, your goal should at least be to get to lift at least your body weight, right? Start start there. Because you're just saying 10 pounds, too much or too little. Now, when you say 10 pounds, is that 10 pounds over your body weight? Or is that just 10 pounds, period? Because at the end of the day, I think you want to go for at least your body weight uh, in terms of external weight, right, on a squat. Uh, JP says, how often should we be hitting the gym during a week? That's a great question. You, you know, listen, JP, I would say that it depends, right? It depends on if it's off season, preseason, in season, right? Or, and then back to the off season, you know, for the most part, for the most part, um, even in season, right? Top experts, Top professionals are lifting at least twice a week, lower body, right? Um, so that could be something like, you know, a Monday or Tuesday, and then perhaps probably at least 48 to 72 hours after that. So for example, if they lift on a Monday, you know, they won't do their next lift till at least Wednesday or Thursday. And you can go longer than that if you'd like. Right, you can go into you can go Friday or into the weekend on a Saturday and and really split it up. That way, you guys can go ahead and get in your sprint work, your gate start technique work. Okay, um, if if two times is not enough, I would say at least at least one time a week, at least right. Especially for us older guys, because for us older guys, it's it's harder for us to recover. Um, However, it's, it's harder for us to recover if we're not used to imposing the demand. So at least one time, one to two times a week is, is, is pretty much, that's gonna be good enough, I would say, for most people. Now, don't get me wrong, I have athletes that wanna train three times a week, okay? And they're like, hey, gee, I, you know, I, wanna, I wanna do legs three times a week. So what do I do? I say, okay, 
<laughs> I'm like, oh, we'll go ahead and do it. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, he's gonna, he's gonna want it, he's gonna want me to change this in about two weeks. And that happens every time. Some weeks you could probably do three times a week lower body. But more times than not, it's not, it's not, it's save that third, that third workout for maybe an upper body day, right? An upper body day where you could you could address, you know, every all things upper body, right? You could do your bent over rows, you work on your back, your lower back, your upper back, your chest, your whatever you want to do, right? Your your accessory uh, muscles, right? Your muscles, if you want to look good and flex at the beach, if you will. But you know, every time I get an athlete that wants to work out three times a week, again, usually by the second week, they're like, "Dude, I'm t I'm tired." It's like, yeah, because listen, you're lifting three times a week, you're doing sprints twice a week, and you're going to track, tw you know, at least twice a week, or doing gates, okay? That's like seven workouts in a week. And when I say a week, I'm talking like a five-day week, right? Because I'm going to integrate two, two rest days. So that being said, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're going to start coupling some of these workouts. And Maybe we're maybe perhaps we're going to start off the, the the beginning of the week with a strength workout in the morning, and then we're going to end with a, a gate session at night. That's totally complimentary. Or perhaps we start off in the morning with a sprint session, and then go into the gym in the afternoon. Or maybe you go out to the track and you do gates, and then we end up in the gym right afterwards. That's what that's what we're doing at the Olympic Training Center day in day out. We do our track work in the morning because these guys had it like that. They didn't have jobs, their job was just to race the bike. And we loved riding the track in the mornings because that was the safest time to do it. Anytime in the afternoon it got really windy and you're hitting these big ass jumps, <laughs> you're asking for trouble. And so we would always, we'd always ride our bikes in the morning, ride the track in the morning, and then lift in the afternoon, okay? Giving you guys more information than you probably needed, but I, I thought that would help, JP. Thank you so much. Let's see here, uh, Days Rock has a question. Have you ever had someone move down on gearing instead of up a gear when the rider looks to be spun out? Water cooler conversation I was having with a friend. Is moving up always the way to go? Let me repeat that question so I understand it one more time. Have you ever had someone move down on gearing instead of up in gearing when the rider looks to be spun out? I would say first and foremost, no, I've, I've never done that. Yeah, if they look to be spun out, certainly at the races, I'm not going to put them down even lower. Now, during training at home away from the track, I would definitely, if, if someone has an under underdeveloped spin, then yes, I would say I would go aggressive. I would go two tooth lower and then have them do sprints with, with a super easy gear, right? And get them used, get them used to getting on top of the gear and, and forcing them to move faster than normal, right? Acceleration wise. I've, I did that, for, I did that for myself a couple times. Um, you don't want to do it. You don't want to impose a demand too much, but I have seen benefits where I lower, I, I did sprints probably six to seven days out from a national with just one tooth lower. And I was doing stand start sprints like a box sprint and keeping, keeping the distance really short. And just really forcing myself to just get right on top of the gear, just get on top of that one, two, three, right? Just that, you know, when you get on top of that one, two, three, the, the tires are chirping on the concrete, the asphalt really nicely. And it's just, you're just getting on top of it. It feels good. It sounds good. Lowering the gear for me did that. And then when I went to the race, I actually went back up to my race gear and my feet were moving with the race gear. And the race gear was, you know, it was something simple like a 44. 4416. So I just, I did sprints with a 4316. And I didn't do many. I only did like a half a dozen. It wasn't like I went out and did 20 sprints um, and, 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 and then decided to keep that gear on there and go out to the track and do gates and then show up to the national and decide I'm going to put on my race gear. No, I only did it for like six sprints and called it a day. Immediately took off that gear and put my race gear right back on. If I went to the track, I'd always practice with my race gear. Okay, so that's how I did it. 
Okay, we have a question, BMX 2525. I'm going to the Vegas National next week and have never been there. Is there anything I should expect? I've been told it's very short and I'm just gonna to try to get an idea of the track. Yeah, it's it's gonna be short, right? Like the, the, the total lap is gonna be like 20 seconds, something goofy like that. I mean, I think it's about 20 seconds, right? Maybe 25. But it's certainly, it, it, it's definitely half the distance of your normal track. And so um, what could you expect? Uh, you could expect um, a very sh a very short first straightaway. They'll probably put a couple jumps on there to where you, know, you can't get a whole lot of pedaling down in. So yeah, so what could you expect? You could probably expect to lower your gear now. Heck, I would even lower your, if it were me, I would take a risk and I would lower my gear two teeth lower and go out and do a short a, a short session of sprints you know nothing longer than you know 45 45 minutes worth of sprints you know lots of rest in between maybe you know enough to get like 10 to 12 sprints in keep the sprints really short right i'm talking real short three to five full cranks practice with two tooth lower than your normal race gear and then when you go to Vegas, go one tooth up, okay? Kind of over compromise in terms of, because here's the thing, if you're, nor, if you're, we'll use even numbers, for example, if you're used to running a 4416 and then you go to the race and it's like, oh my gosh, this gear feels really hard. You put the 43 on, it's like, oh wow, you know, this gear feels kind of weird, but it also feels kind of hard and it's like, I'm not moving it fast enough. You're not moving it fast enough because you're not used to spinning out and easier gear. So what, so the idea is it's all, it's all CNS. It's all central nervous system. It's all neurological. So you have to train the neurological system to adapt to an easier gear where everything moves faster. You have to react faster and everything moves faster. And that's, a, that's the thing that people forget when they change gears right? You go down one tooth. It's like, dude, if you're not getting on top of that gear, if you're not getting on top of your normal race gear, you can forget it. Like you, you're better off probably going to the gym in the morning and just, and doing some strength work and then showing up the track and being a little bit more neurologically stimulated and activated than changing the gear. Cause if you change the gear, it's like, dude, you forget you have to react faster and everything moves faster. Right. If you're not powerful already to get on top of your normal race gear, you can forget it. It's only worked out one time for me in, in, in 15 years of professional racing where I actually went down a gear and I did really well in one. Right. And it was like some indoor race in Wichita, Kansas. Right. And, um, you know, really short, steep starting hill probably wasn't this probably just as tall as, you know, the desk here. And, you know, one half pedal out of the gate, bam, on the flat, right? And that's where that, that easier gear. Now, if it was just kind of like, you know, really mellow starting hill like that, putting on an easier gear, I probably would have had a hard time with it. But it, with the gate start being so abrupt in relation to the, in relation to the, the um, what am I trying to say here? The, the, the bottom of the starting hill, that easier gear was was everything for me. It, it made a huge difference. But more times than not, just, just by dropping down a tooth, you have to think about reacting faster and your acceleration power has to be, it has to be moving even faster. Same thing when it comes to putting on a bigger gear at the races, right? Okay, yeah, you might not have to react as fast, but you need more strength, man. You need more strength to get on top of that gear. If you're not getting, if you're not getting on top of, that gear and you're behind the gear, you're falling behind, you can forget it. So that's the thing, I, I don't like changing gears at the track and this is what I'm trying to say to the, to the guy that's going to Vegas, I'm trying to give you a secret tip, hopefully no one else watches this video, but that's what I would do. It's gonna be a very, very short first straightaway, there's not gonna be much pedaling, they're gonna have, probably have a jump, they're gonna have a jump at the bottom of the starting hill and they might even have a rhythm section out of the starting hill for all I know. They've done that to us before. I remember there was a race in Conroe, Texas. They did that shit. But <laughs> listen, it's a short first straight, short track. Don't change the gear when you get there. Change the gear now. Today's Tuesday. 
after this, I shoot, I would just leave this live feed and just start changing your gear now. Go to two tooth lower and and start doing some 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 sprints right now. <laughs> All right, guys, man, you guys, this is great. I love you. I love this stuff here. Um, Edwin Alvarez, hey Coach G, first time live here in six days a week at the track. Enough of a track workout. Is that five or six? In my eyes, six days a week. Yeah, that's more than enough, man. You know, listen, Edwin, our, the topic today is to improve your gate start. So if you're going out to the track to work on your technique, that's great. But what are we doing for power development, right? What are we doing for alternative power development? Because going out to the track, doing the same thing day in, day out, expecting a different result is kind of like insanity, right? So you have to impose different demands. And that's what we were talking about in the beginning of the show uh, as it relates to uh, the context of improving your gate starts. Yeah, you can go out to the track and, and, and work on your technique, but if you're not doing your sprints, if you're not working on your strength and power, if you don't have the discipline to work on your strength and power week in, week out, then where's the development? How long have you, Edwin, let me ask you this, man. How long have you been going out to the track six days a week and are you seeing improvement? I'm curious. Days Rock says, thank you so much for your answer and advice. Really appreciate it you and this show. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, okay. Someone's talking about decimal gearing. I don't know if you're talking to me or you're talking to someone else. Let's see. Let's look for other questions. Um, SM BMX. I have used your gate starts in training. I'm quick off the gate, but have been struggling lately with hitting the gate. Any suggestions? Ooh, hitting the gate. Hey, hitting the gate's not a bad thing. That just means that you're either getting faster, getting more powerful, uh, and that's not a bad thing. Now, in terms of hitting the gate and working on your timing, perhaps the best thing that you can do is just move your hips back, shift them back a little bit. Okay. The biggest mistake that most people do when they're hitting the gate is like, Oh, you know what? I'm just going to leave on the second horn or the second light. And I don't care for that. I, I always or unconsciously. If you're doing enough gate starts, you're going to react when you, when you're, you're going to react on the way you've trained yourself to react, right? So unconsciously, if you trained yourself to master movement on the first horn or first light, and then you decide, you know what? I'm hitting the gate and I'm going to move on the second light or second horn. It ain't going to work. It ain't going to work because you're going to try to limit yourself from moving unconsciously on that first horn, first light. You're holding yourself back and it's like, oh, dude, like, I don't want to hit the gate. And all of a sudden you got negative goals. Guess what's going to happen? You're either going to hit the gate or and and or you're not going to give it 100 percent to come out of the gate. Right. You need 100 percent. So in an effort for you to get that 100 percent in an effort to not end in an effort to not play with the unconscious mind, what it's trained to do without thinking just simply change your stance and shift your hips back. Okay. And that will pad the delay and prevent you from hitting the gate. It should work. I'm curious. Give it a try. Email me info at bmxtraining.com. I want to see it. I want to know if it worked. Edwin Alvarez, he came back, says gate practice considered sprints two months. Okay. So he's done, he's gone to the track eight weeks in a row, six times a week. Well, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, that's dedication, right? But I would say, you know, for what purpose are you going out to the track six times a week? Okay. Cause at the end of the day, that's all that really matters to you. If the purpose is, is to get out there and, you know, like, listen, man, like, Look, I played I played adult league hockey for five or six years, and I certainly wasn't going to play um, at any other league where we were traveling. I wasn't going to play national adult league hockey or pond hockey or any of that. I mean, I, I wasn't going to go pro, right? I'm, I'm I'm just a dude that was playing beer league hockey, and that's about it. And yes, even as even as someone that 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 can get serious on something that's goofy as beer league hockey, I would try to get, hit the ice as much as I can. Getting that ice time is critical 
in, ter in terms of developing all those skating skills and puck handling skills and, and game time skills that I needed in an effort to develop. So if you're going out to the track consistently, day, you know, day in, day out, six times a week in an effort to work on everything, right? Just throw a buffet of everything at you, such as, you know, gate starts, pumping, manling, turns, right? Uh, practicing rhythm skills, practicing jumping skills, practicing manling skills, practicing all these things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're going out to the track every day and you're gung ho and you want to improve in all these areas, go at it. I have no problems with it. And at some point, when you start to develop these skills, you're going to realize that you will need alternative. You're going to need alternative training away from the track. And unfortunately, it's going to be really hard for you to do it's going to be really hard for you to go really deep into strength and power development if you're going to the track six days a week. So I would try to I would try to break it up, at least split the week in half, maybe a Wednesday or Thursday. Find a day where you can get a full day off from any kind of physical, emotional, mental stress. Get some restoration, and that way you you can go ahead and continuously progress and have fun and not burn out. That's what I would do, Edwin. Cool. Uh, let's see here. Guys, if you guys have a question for me, I would say, hey, coach. If you guys say, hey, coach, I have a question. Or just say, hey, coach, like Matt Johnson says, hey, coach, thanks for the show. I enjoy listening to your, your experience, techniques, and advice. Man, Matt, I, I'm grateful for you to show up. I'm glad to be your coach. Um, Because there's a lot of guys in here having conversations uh, amongst each other, so they, it kind of messes me up. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to get on you guys, but if you guys want me to answer your question, give me a hey coach. That way, I could uh, I could sift through these comments faster. All right, so we got about seven minutes left. I'm I'm up for a few more questions, going deep into the questions. Again, as it relates to gate starts, and um, I think we're doing pretty good here. We got a lot of good. Hey, coach, up top. Okay, Jacob, let's see. Let's see. What do you got? What do you got, Jacob? Okay, here you go, Jacob. Jacob James says, I move weight once a week, but do core plyos, hips, lower back on different days. Arms too. So what's your question, man? Is that just, is that just a comment? All right, Jacob, here's your question. I think I found it, man. Um, Jacob James says, I've been off the track for two months due to injury. Though I did squeak in the 14-day gate start training challenge, right? Okay, yeah, you did the gate start, the gate start reaction training challenge on BMX Training Pro on the, on the membership website. Gotcha. My problem is I keep banging the gate. I can only lean back and kick the butt back so far. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's great. So you're reacting too fast now? Is that what you're telling me? Put a bigger gear on. <laughs> that's what I would do. <laughs> if you're getting stronger, you're reacting fast, put a bigger gear on. It sounds like it's time for you to just put the bigger gear on, put the big meat on and just go at it. Oh, okay, here. JJ Molly has a question. Has a she JJ Molly Please forgive me. I, I I don't want to mind read if you're um, a boy or a girl or a man or a woman, but hey, coach, my sprocket is 39 tooth and that is easy for me, but the 40 tooth is a bit hard. What do you advise? Ooh, okay, great question. And I'm going to ask you a question and then you're going to come back to me and then I'm going to help you out here. My question is, which gear do you want to want? Which gear do you want to run? Right? Which gear do you want to run? Do you want to do you want to run the 39 or is it the 40? Is this on a cruiser? Danny Booby has a question. Hey coach, what's your thoughts on same rollout but small versus higher chain rings? Example 4717 versus 4516. The theory the theory of higher front allows smoother pedal stroke. <laughs> Great question. Go to go to Renan, go to RenanBMX.com 
He has, uh, George Cost over at Renan, um, has a PDF download, a write-up on the theory of uh, bigger chain rings up front, you know, allowing it to have more torque and all this stuff. Now, in theory, right, like in mechanical standard in engineering, they say, you know, the, the bigger cog has more leverage, therefore it's going to turn over fast. It's going to turn over easier, right, it's with, with less stress. Now, here's the thing. Here's the crazy part, Danny. There is no, I'm pretty sure there's no tooth, like these gear ratios that you just gave me, man, 47, 17, 45, 16, they're not the same. They're, they're just not. They're, they're not identical, right? It's not like it's a, um, it's not like it's a, uh, I, man, I need to bring up George's website actually now. Now, now you got me thinking. Renanbmx.com. Oh, did he lose it? Let's see here. Renan Design Group. Renandesigngroup.com. That's the one. Let's see if I can find this. Okay, here. Products. Gear Ratio Calculator. I think we go to Gear Ratio Calculator. Okay, and then here we go. Here it is. Renan Tech Talk, California Gear, right? This was the California Gearing Talk. So I, I, I got to give you some, some backstory on the California Gearing. But basically, he has the big gear versus small gear set up. And he did the math. And there is no mechanical advantage. That's, and this guy, you know, he went to MIT, right? He went to MIT. I really don't know anyone that's smarter than him in BMX. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, he says it right here. Back back in 2001, I first learned of the notorious California gear. He said he was attending a West Coast National and had the pleasure of meeting Donnie Robinson's father. Um, Donnie Robinson's father. Uh, Donnie was new in the pro class, and, and, and it was funny. I'm not going to read it because I think it's easier if I just tell the story. Basically, uh, Donnie's father is like, yeah, he's, he's got the California gearing on. He's getting two extra pedal strokes um for every revolution and, and george was like really like that's interesting um but no that's that's the thing right like in uh, you know the, here's the thing it, it seems like a lot of people are going with the big gear and really at the end of the day they're just trying to split gears they're just trying to optimize and and fine tune the gear that that's that's all they're trying to do man otherwise it's like there is no there is no advantage there there really isn't Okay, enough on that. Um, let's see here. So JJ Molly says it, it, he's a boy, it's on a class bike. Okay, so if it's on a 20 inch bike, you know, we were just talking about splitting gears. JJ Molly, you know, two, two things that you could do. Uh, and there's, there's so many different things that you could do when it comes to gears. And I know it's like, we're trying to keep in the context of gate starts here, but we'll help you out here, my man. Listen, um, when it comes to gears, right, 39 is too easy. Okay, are you doing sprint training? Oh, then you're going to tell me the 40 tooth. The 40 tooth is a bit hard. What do you advise? Are you doing any strength training? If it's too easy, are you doing any sprint training? If it's too hard, are you doing any sprint training or any strength training? That's, as a coach, that's what I'm going to say, right? Uh, you know, otherwise I could, I could be a BMX dad. I'm not a BMX dad, but I could be a BMX dad, right? And just whip out a gear calculator and just be like, hey man, why don't you consider running, you know, a 39.1, you know, do some decimal gears or, or maybe, you know, on your back tires, shave off uh, a millimeter all the way around and, and, and run the 40 and that'll make the 40 feel more like a 39 and a half, if you will, right? Like, or you could just throw a 16 on the back and just run a 40, a 44, man, right? At the end of the day, like there's so many different ways you could skin the cat. But listen, at the end of the day, I, someone got on my case about, you know, saying at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what are you doing to train the engine? Because so many people are focused on the transmission, right? You guys are focused on, on gearing. And I think that's great. And are you guys doing anything for the engine, right? We're BMX training. We're not BMX. We're not BMXtransmission.com here. We're BMX training. We focus on the engine, uh, the physical engine, the emotional engine, 
um, the mental engine, right? The winning time engine, the strategy engine. And so, listen, I, I've been down this road uh, many times with myself and many of my athletes trying to figure out gears. And it's like, you're beating yourself up emotionally and mentally over a gear. Why don't you just get stronger? If you want to run that 40, JJ, let's get stronger, bro. Let, let's let's fix it. Let's Let's just get stronger. Put the 40 on and start doing some flat ground sprints. Start doing some body weight exercises. Start getting underneath the bar. Start doing some plyometrics. Start doing some uphill sprints. Put in the work. Because if you're just, you know, listen, I'd say at the end of the day, it behooves anybody to run the biggest gear that they can that allows them to get out of the gate and accelerate it without getting cut off. That's it. And if you can't do that, then you're going to end up putting on a gear that's going to compromise you from doing just that. Right? You're going to put on the easier gear, so it feels like it's if so it feels like it's reacting, so it feels like I'm accelerating. No, man, work on the engine. I'm not trying to get on your case. I'm just thinking like I'm talking to myself. You know, like I'm just projecting, man. Like these are things that I would say to myself. So it's I, you know, please forgive me. It's not like I'm trying to give you a hard time. I, I would never do that. Um, but at the end of the day, that's that's the key, right? Like work on the engine and then fine tune the transmission. All right. And of course I'm mind reading, right? Cause maybe you are in the BMX training pro community and maybe you are doing some of the workouts in there. Um, and that's great. Okay. So JJ was saying, Hey coach, well, I was thinking that maybe I could do sprints and stuff on a 40 tooth until I feel comfortable racing it in it. Is that a good way to experiment? This is on a normal expert XL bike. Yeah. I mean, sure yeah you could put on listen if if you want to feel good on a 40 tooth why don't you put on a 41 tooth and do sprints on it and then go down to the 40 tooth and start showing up to the track and just and just put it on and and set it for and forget it that's what i say put it on set it forget it rob doherty says hey coach thanks for the knowledge um guys man it's so awesome um Man, I'm so grateful and honored to be your coach. Uh, I see one more question. I'll, I'll hit. I'll do that one here in a second. But listen, if you guys are finding any value and you want to continuously support me, go to bmxtraining.com, become a member. Uh, that would be awesome. If not, at least leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. Anything that you guys do, I really appreciate it. Any support that you guys give me supports other people. Again, our our mission here is to help out as many newer and younger riders as we can, as well as some of the older riders that are coming back and finding their way back into our beloved sport that is BMX racing. And so, you know, the goal at the end of the day is to continuously help out those riders that show up to the track. So share this information with me. Uh, I'm sorry, share this information uh, with other riders uh, that I'm providing. And um, man, that would be more than enough. But if you, again, if you guys want more, check out bmxtraining.com, become a member. Uh, like Matt McCluey here, he has a question. And he says, hey coach, any tips for dealing with high winds in the gate? We seldom get a race in Kansas without high wind and being clipped in, it gets dicey. Whew, that's a tough one. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, what, you know, the geek in me would be like, yeah, you know, get a water cooler fan and, you know, find some blowers and, 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 you know, set up a gate at home and, and have someone blow wind at you. But that's kind of lame at the end of the day. Listen, um, you have to you, the guys in Australia, um, the, not the guys in Australia, the guys in England, please forgive me. I wasn't, I was thinking like accents, right? But I have clients in both England and, and Australia. It's awesome. The guys in England are really good at racing in the wind because it's always windy. <laughs> so, if there's a if if it's a windy day and you're scheduled to go to the track, my my best tip would be to not avoid going to the track. I go out there and just practice gates exclusively. Forget all the 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 nonsense of 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 doing full lap work and working on rhythm and just go up there and just focus on your gates while it's windy. That's the best thing that you can do. All right, guys. Hey, listen. Have an awesome rest of your Tuesday. If you're in Australia, ha- enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Guys, have a great week. I'll see you guys next Tuesday. 
You guys keep training hard, keep working hard, keep practicing your, your technique in the gates, keep working on your strength and power, keep working on your discipline, keep showing up week in, week out, and you guys will be faster, trust me. All right. Guys, listen, it was, it was an honor to be here uh, today. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. I am out.